it's weird and it's not weird. It's very quiet. And that's the part that's weird about it. We're talking about a building that is normally always noisy, always bustling, people are always around. And sort of pre-COVID, when the semester went in, it was obvious the semester had ended because the noise just dropped dramatically. Like all of a sudden it was quiet. And it has been like that now for an extended period of time. And that is so weird. interesting is like how quickly you can actually get used to something um, because I think there's a period of time where I just felt like this does not feel normal like this doesn't feel right and I have a routine now and it's been a couple months since we've come back to campus and I think one of the weirdest things at first is New Paltz is like just in a beautiful location it, it, you can see, you know, the ridge in the distance. You can see the mountains right now. Everything's changing color. It's so gorgeous to be here. And the campus is just silent. The energy is like, honestly, really weird. Like, I feel like no one like kind of knows how to navigate being on campus because we're all wearing masks all the time. And like, if you're like not with like the people that you live with, like, like everyone has a mask on and is pretty much socially distanced. So the energy is like honestly really strange. Going into the semester back to, there were just a lot of questions about how we were gonna make a lot of this work. It was clear for us that we needed to make a significant change and that gave us the time to build the infrastructure required. And so we went through all of the courses that were scheduled to be offered and figured out which could be offered online most effectively which really would be um, sort of sacrificed or the experience for the students would be sacrificed if we move them completely online. So we looked for ways to offer them in a kind of hybrid model. The, the way that New Paltz in particular split up their classes is you kind of had like three different ways you could do your class. So one would be like in person at a like much lower capacity than normal. Um, one was a synchronous version of a class where it would be all, all online, but you'd have like regular meeting times, you'd have like a regular class time and interaction with other students and professors. And then asynchronous classes, which are essentially at your own speed. There is no official class time and it's more like just a series of assignments that you have to do by certain dates and you're not necessarily in a classroom setting. What we wanted to do is have the time to prepare our spaces in order to support those classrooms and, and those classes in a, in a safe and healthy way. We have these huge like plexiglass walls essentially that we move around and we put in between people. Um, and so it's been an interesting set of obstacles. Um, and especially as like theater people who like crave being around one another, it definitely has been weird to see spaces that are no longer full of people and bustling anymore. The kinds of exercises that are happening in performance classes are different. The kinds of scene work that is happening in directing class is different. The kind of exercises that people use to explore space and, and relationships and, and, you know, sort of listening and communicating are, are fundamentally different, uh, particularly because at six feet and further and being masked, the instrument is different than when you are uh, using your entire body and your entire physicality. And I think, you know, in, in some of the design classes, what's happening is um, the distance does sort of change the rhythm that we are using in the room, you know, instead of kind of working towards uh, a pattern of back and forth and, a, and an opportunity to kind of spitball ideas and, and bounce off of each other. There is a kind of slower, more methodical approach to ensure that everyone really is kind of keeping their distance. And I think 
not only physically, but I think internally, we are all keeping our distance a little bit, and that changes the way we're, we're working through different problems. Just making conversation. Sure. Just trying to start a conversation. Oh, no, sure, but still. Do you know why it's impossible to lick the tips of your elbows? And we also, you know, jettisoned our uh, production season and came up with an, a new plan that would allow a commitment to storytelling and a commitment to the process while still providing some flexibility to make changes. Hi, my name is Dom Torres and I'm the assistant director for the SUNY New Pulse's staged reading of Cadillac Crew. When I came to Dom about working on Cadillac Crew, one of the things that I knew was just going to be amazing about Dom is that I could truly look at Dom as a colleague, despite the fact that they are a student. I am really lucky, first and foremost, to have worked with the director that I worked with, um, Dr. Martine Green Rogers. I love her so much. Um, she just so happens to be both my academic advisor and the head of my concentration. So I spent a lot of time with her. What made the process most successful was that we sat down before anything started and talked about kind of the expectations, both that she has as a director and both what I wanted to get out of the experience as a student. We were like, what are we doing? How are we even going about doing this? and uh, uh, Cadillac Crew became the guinea pig in some respects. Not one detail hasn't been checked 10, 20 times. I've crossed every T and dotted every I. I assure you, there is no mistake. If Mrs. Parks attends, she will not be in the platform, but somewhere in the crowd with the rest of us. Think about the repercussions of unbearable weight this will put on our community. Women are supposed to be the backbone of the movement, not the foot on the neck of it. Now that is an embarrassing distraction. I won't sit back and idly watch myself be written out of history. And I won't commit to dying behind any woman who doesn't have enough sense to know that our names are highly respected when written alone. So my actual coming into virtual colla uh, theater collaboration was really interesting because after uh, you know the shutdowns in February and March of everything closing, like the last thing I wanted to do was more theater. And then once I crossed that hump, I was like, I need to do something else. So I had just spent from like April to August producing student work, doing a lot of Zoom theater, if you will. In the second week, you should have your first read throughs. You should have a dramaturgical presentation and really start kicking off rehearsals. Uh, the next week is all production meetings and rehearsals. And then you'll see as we start to get into these final two weeks, um, what obviously makes VTC a little different is that the final product is filmed and edited together as opposed to put on a stage. So it's really important to just be conscious time-wise. And so one of the upsides of doing a completely virtual, everyone is sitting in their zoom boxes of death one of the upsides is that you get faces but then the trade-off is that they're not in the same space at the same time talking to one another we would be in the same building for hours and not see a single other person because we each had to be kind of quarantined for lack of a better word in our own room and so we each had you know a mic set up the actors um our lighting designer built these sort of lighting boxes to help kind of control the amount of light each actor was getting on their face. Um, mic setups, computer setups, script setups. I would even say with Cadillac Crew, there was a production element to it. Dom did some amazing choreography for some of the moments for us. Okay, this is the slow version from Tatiana's perspective. If you have questions about where you start or what sequence you're doing, we can talk about it tomorrow during rehearsal. Switch your phone over. Just 
I did was kind of created a movement piece, essentially, of like a series of gestures that mimicked things that you would be doing in an office. And uh, we, the sound designer and I kind of worked together and created this thing where we're watching them go fast, go fast, go fast, and as time is going and change isn't happening as fast as they want, they kind of lose their steam towards the end and pitter out. And it was just moments like that in, in terms of like, okay, all I have is this space here. How can I create movement choreography in this space while everyone is sitting down? To create a show while you're all socially distanced and all over Zoom is really, uh, it's like kind of difficult to navigate at first. If you were in a room with a bunch of people, you could just pull one person aside and like ask a quick question. That's now a whole formal email that you have to write and CC like three people. Natasha, D'Amico and I are doing a series of small projects in an independent study where she is working as the designer for some of our stage readings. This gives her an opportunity to collaborate with directors and other designers, but I still have the opportunity to work with her and sort of mentor her through the design process. Uh, everything from sort of how to read the play as a designer all the way through the creation of a, of a, of a, yeah, an environment to tell the story. I have been studying with Ken Goldstein for just over a year now, and I have learned a ridiculous amount from him. There are times where we do a lot of work uh, virtually online. She'll be at her computer, I'll be at mine, and we'll look at research and, and talk about the play and, and work on some skills, everything from drafting to to other kinds of graphic skills. Um, but whenever possible, we try to meet in the classroom and really look at her work and, and watch how the, the work is developing. And she's at a pretty specific stage right now uh, in terms of being a designer and that she has these incredible ideas and incredible sense of the world of the play. And so we're looking at different ways to kind of work through how to get those ideas onto the page as part of a process that opens up collaboration with the other, the other storytellers on the team. This semester, I just wrapped up working on Waiting for Lefty, which um, is a pretty straightforward show, but it's set in 1935. So when I approached my design for it, I definitely took a more historical viewpoint into it. And it made me do a lot of historical research and learn a bunch of things that I didn't learn from history classes or anything. And from there, I was able to develop a design for it. Because of the, the reality on campus, where thankfully the numbers of cases has been incredibly low and our community seems to be responding appropriately to following protocols and, and social distancing measures, we're actually letting the cast rehearse in the, in the theater. Um, but that really boiled down to an opportunity where we had the director and designers and dramaturgs working on this project as if we were going to realize it fully, uh, and then step back and really rehearse a very clean and um, kind of elegant and simple reading. Stand up and show yourself, you damn red. Be a man. Let's see what you look like. My mind's made up. No hard feelings? Sure, hard feelings. I went into I'm not that the first type design type. meeting with research from 1935, and then also research from like 2008 and like Krona picture photography and stuff. So I, I didn't know what world we were about to create, but through the visual imagery that I gathered, we were all able to develop the world this play should exist in. And I think one of the things that's been sort of lovely to watch is the evolution as we've figured out our COVID protocols, as we figured out what is the technology that we're using and how we can use it as the students are getting more proficient in it. We can, each, each show has pushed the boundary just a little bit. I mean, it's such a cliche to say that you learn as much from your students as you hope they learn from you, but it'd be foolish not to believe that's the case. I mean, I think semester after semester, week after week, there are perspectives and opinions and thoughts that absolutely make me reconsider things that I've just sort of accepted or taken for granted. And so I, I really appreciate that opportunity to work with them. I also think for as much as we've all become accustomed and sort of um, interested in communicating through a screen and social media and all the things that sort of have led us up to the last six months, 
I think we also have a generation of people who are finding the value in human connection again. And so one of the things I'm hoping comes out of this is a true desire for people to want to be with people. Just because theater is suffering right now, storytelling doesn't stop. And so what are we learning about how we can do this better? And I mean that on a social level, the reckoning that's happening with We See You, White American Theater. I think the reckoning that is happening in terms of funding for the arts, that is all something that we can take the time now to be better and to do better. My hope for the theater community is that we grow towards something more genuine and more caring. Society is kind of realizing that there are a lot of voices that we don't listen to. And theater is one of those places where those voices can be like screamed, like we can amplify voices to a really uh, high degree. I think part of why theater education is so important right now is that we are on the precipice, a new frontier for what it is that theater is and will be for a little while and maybe even just going forward. I think it's not enough anymore to expect artists to be talented. Now it's making more conscious artists, making, you know, not just artists, but like people who are conscious of things that are happening that are self-aware, that are aware of injustice when they see it. What we're training students to do isn't just for the theater. And I think that, you know, entering the world as an artist and entering the world as somebody who understands human emotion and empathy and is able to communicate with different groups and able to hear other groups and understand stories and context serves humanity. I'm so proud of our students so proud of them and not even that they need me to be proud of them because one of the things that I keep talking to them about is that they don't need outside affirmation of anything that they're doing they just need to find all of the joy in their own souls in order to keep doing this work and finding their place in their space in this industry but I'm just so proud of how just watching them grow in their artistry because they know that we are all in this together and that we've all just rolled up our sleeves and said okay we want to tell stories, how the ham and cheese sandwich are we going to do that?